The Call of Cthulhu, written by H.P. Lovecraft. horror in clay. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance, in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little. But some day the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality, and of our frightful position therein, that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race from transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly, if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in this so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926-27, with the death of my great-uncle, George Gamel Angel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Angel was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions, and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after being jostled by a nautical-looking negro who had come from one of the queer dark courts on the precipitous hillside which formed a shortcut from the waterfront of the deceased's home in William Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded, after perplexed debate, that some obscure lesion of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. At the time I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but latterly I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder. As my great-uncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society. But there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much averse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried in his pocket. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so, seemed only to be confronted by a greater and more closely locked barrier. For what could be the meaning of the queer glass bas-relief and the disjointed jottings and ramblings and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle in his latter years become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for his apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bas-relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick, about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing. And writing of some kind, the bulk of these designs seems certainly to be, though my memory, despite much of the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species or even hint at its remotest affiliations. 
Above these apparent hieroglyphics was a figure of evident pictorial intent. Though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear of its nature, it seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy tentacle head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings in Professor Angel's most recent hand, and made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cult, in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. This manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dreamwork of H.A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, R.I., and the second, Narrative of Inspector John R. Legrasse, 121 Benville Street, New Orleans, L.A. At 1908, A.A.S. Notes on the same, and Professor Webb's account. The other manuscript papers were brief notes, some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different persons, some of them citations from theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Eliot's Atlantist and the Lost Lemuria and the rest comments on long-surviving secret societies and hidden cults with references to passages in such mythological and anthropological sourcebooks as Fraser's Golden Bough and Miss Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe. The cuttings largely alluded to ultra-mental illness and outbreaks of group folly or mania in the spring of 1925.